Well, hello, this is Adam. Welcome to Rare Classic Cars. Happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you. Hope you're enjoying it. Today we're going to talk about something that just singes the hearts of General Motors fans in terms of worst engines of all time, and that is a variant, a particular variant, of the Oldsmobile diesel engine. Yes, <gasps> the Oldsmobile diesel. Yes, we're going to talk about it. So, <clears throat> here goes. Well, when normally you think of the Oldsmobile diesel engine, for those who are aware of it, you think of the 350 cubic inch V8 diesel. But little known is that Oldsmobile also made two other variations of that engine, a 4.3 liter V8 diesel and a 4.3 liter V6 diesel. So we're going to talk about the latter most and discuss some of its good and bad elements, mostly bad because of the reputation that it was inherited from the 5.7 liter engine. So just backing up a second, we'll set the stage a little bit. And what, why is it called an Oldsmobile diesel? Well, before the 1977 model year, each GM division really made almost all of its own engines. So the Chevrolet 350 was different from the Pontiac 350, different from the Olds 350, different from the Buick 350. They were all completely different aside from some very basic engine control, you know, carburetor, distributor, sometimes spark plugs, basic parts. Everything else was completely different. So the Oldsmobile division of GM was tasked with coming up with and devising a diesel powered engine to really help the corporation meet the corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards that were being enacted in the late 70s and which required GM to get the corporate average fleet economy, so the gas mileage across, or I should say the fuel mileage across all of the vehicles that they sold up to 27 and a half miles per gallon by the mid 80s. Up from in 1974, it was just about 13, 14 miles per gallon. So they effectively had to double the mileage of the cars. And this is one of the things that really contributed to the downfall of the Detroit 3. Yes, there were management uh, bad decisions for sure. Yes, there were many other uh, culprits for that downfall. But one of them was that Detroit and the Big 3 had to go from making big, heavy cars powered by big engines that got very poor mileage all the way to front wheel drive, transverse engines, uh, and in general, much lighter, much smaller vehicles and do it rapidly. So one of the great benefits that Toyota and Honda and Nissan and the Japanese had during this time and the Europeans was that they never built anything as big as the domestic cars, not even the intermediate sized cars of the time. Uh, so they really were on the right side of the corporate average fuel economy standards and didn't have to do anything to meet them. Their cars and what they sold already met it. Whereas GM, Ford and Chrysler had to just kill their entire product portfolio and redo every vehicle at the same time. And even for a company like General Motors with the vast amount of resources that it has, to re-engineer almost every platform that you're doing all at once is something that never happens. You would never have that in a normal planning cadence. Having been on the inside and worked for GM, you just don't do that. You have programs in different stages because remember, you only have a set amount of engineering workforce and design teams and you know pick durability teams you only have a certain amount of headcount that you can have to uh, to execute this kind of profound change and the headcount and the staffing levels were such that they were staffed for a normal program cadence kind of redoing a program you know let's say every five ish years sometimes a little less sometimes a little more and not redoing them all at once. So for instance, the 71 GM full-size vehicles, that was the first year of the new full-size cars. 73, they redid the intermediates. They didn't do both in 1971. They would do them kind of in succession. So this was a case where everything kind of had to be rebooted in a very abbreviated time period. And one of the ways that GM came up with meeting this, especially in the big cars, was not to necessarily re-engineer the platform, but to throw a diesel engine in it because diesels are inherently more efficient than gas engines and usually about 30%-ish more efficient. And so this was a, the, the thought process. And the task fell to the Oldsmobile division to come up with these diesels. And it came up in 1978 with the first one, 
the 350 cubic inch diesel. And unfortunately, it really just sullied the reputation of every variant thereafter, including the 4.3 that we're going to talk about. And it had a few major flaws. I would say most chief among them was that there was no water separation system on these diesels in a time when diesel fuel and the quality of it was not that reliable. The, they had no water separate, and then later they had a little flag on the dashboard that would come up if a sensor detected water in the fuel. But then you got to get the car towed to the dealer. There was no way to drain it aside from taking it to the dealer. So that wasn't great either. And they also, in order to save money on tooling and time also, remember these cars had to be introduced quickly to meet the corporate average fuel economy standard. So unfortunately, GM was doing R&D on its customers. Um, they also, to use the same tooling, they had the same uh, structure of head bolts, the same number of head bolts per cylinder, four. Um, four per cylinder on the Olds 350 diesel is on the Olds 350 gas engine. And diesel engines inherently run under much more stresses and strains than gas engines. For example, a typical gas engine at the time would have had an 8 to 1 compression ratio. So the piston at the bottom of its stroke compresses that volume of air and squishes it to one-eighth of its original volume before it starts going back down again. A diesel is opposed to that ratio being 8 to 1. So let's say the 8 to 1 looks like this. You know, the, that's the top of the compression stroke was 22 to 1, meaning the top of the compression stroke was much higher. And that is done because diesels are compression ignition engines. The fuel self-ignites. And in order to self-ignite, it has to get hot. How do you get fuel and air hot? Well, you compress it even further. And the more you compress air and fuel together, the hotter they get. So that's how diesels work. So they're under, consequently, higher stresses and strains. And using the same number of head bolts per cylinder head just was not a good idea and consequently they blew head gaskets pretty frequently uh, the head bolts were not strong enough and there were some other general drivability issues but I would say the two big issues were the head bolts and the head design and the clamping force on the head because of uh, using the same uh, head bolt pattern as the gas engine and also the lack of a water separation system and again, I could go on for more. The injection pump, the Rusa Master pump was okay. It had some issues. They were tough to tune because the dealer technicians didn't understand them all that well. Remember, this was a new setup. So this really just sullied the reputation of Oldsmobile and GM's attempt to go into the diesel market. In 1981, GM had 60% of the U.S. diesel market with these Olds diesels which was good and bad because by the time the 4.3 liter V6 diesel came around in 1982, it was outfitted in longitudinal applications like the G bodies and transverse applications like the A bodies and the C bodies. So the G body being the Regal, the Cutlass, you know, the big, not big, intermediate sized rear wheel drive vehicles. Uh, and then the, the A body being the Celebrity, Sierra, Century, and the 6,000, and the C bodies being the 85, DeVille, Electra, and Ohls 98. So this 4.3 liter V6 went into a number of GM, in, uh, GM uh, vehicles. And GM was so bullish on this whole 4.3 liter V6 that it built a dedicated engine plant, the Delta engine plant in Lansing, Michigan, just for this engine. And it launched in 1982, and just three model years later, 1985, it was put out to pasture. The whole Olds diesel program was sunset. So these engines were available, like I said, in the A bodies from 1982 to 85, and they were available in the C bodies, the full-size front-wheel drive cars, just for the 1985 model year. That was it. And Olds had really learned by this point, you know, the uh, shortcomings of the original diesel engines they put out. So there was a water separator and they did have six bolts per cylinder on the cylinder heads to really strengthen that as well. And this was, even though it's the same size as a Chevrolet 4.3 liter V6, the gas engine, totally different. Nothing in common with that Chevrolet engine. This was basically an Olds 350 V8 with two cylinders lopped off. And then it had some, you know, various differences, shall we say. Um, associated with that. But it was, Olds never made a 4.3 liter V6 engine. This was kind of a diesel from the start. 
and in general it was pretty good. It made about 85 horsepower, I believe, 85, 90-ish horsepower, 160, 65 pound-feet of torque. So, you know, what is that like? Uh, the Iron Duke 2.5 liter four-cylinder was making about the same, 85, 90 horsepower during the era, and the torque was about 30 foot-pounds more than the Iron Duke, so it had a little bit more torque, a little bit more pep than the Iron Duke. It's kind of like saying you're the valedictorian of the reform school, but uh, and it probably sounded like the Iron Duke for those of you um, who've, who've driven an Iron Duke powered car like me. They do sound a bit like diesels in some years. But it really was quite pleasant. I've driven an A body, a Cutlass Sierra Brome, with one of these 4.3 liter V6 diesels. I almost bought one. I didn't. Kind of regret it, but can't buy them all. And I found it to be peppy. It wasn't fast, but it had quite a bit of torque. It was uh, clattery a little bit. Um, you definitely heard the diesel engine noise. But I would say in general, this 4.3 liter V6 was okay. It wasn't horrible, it wasn't great. But it wasn't as horrible as the 5.7 liter engines that uh, had come before, particularly the non-DX Oldsmobile diesel engines that they came out with in the late 70s when this whole program started. So, it's interesting, this whole Olds diesel thing went from nothing to 60% of the U.S. diesel market in 1981 to again being sunset after the 1985 model year. Olds thinking that they were going to have a dedicated plant, as I mentioned, just for this V6 engine alone, and the program just got killed because of the reputation. So I would say having owned, I've owned a 79 Seville with a 350 diesel. I've driven that uh, Cutlass Sierra diesel I mentioned with the 4.3 V6. You know, the, the early 350 diesels really aren't that great. You've got to baby them. You do not drive them hard. Uh, the later ones from, with the DX blocks from 1981-ish on are not bad. They're actually halfway decent. And the V6 diesel, this 4.3 liter, is also not that bad, but I wouldn't call them great either. So, in any case, hope you learned a little bit about the Oldsmobile 4.3 liter V6 diesel. And if any of you have one in a car, post a link below so people can see it. It's, uh, it's a really tight fit in the A bodies. I mean, you think a 3.8 liter V6 is a tight fit in there? This 90 degree, you know, which 3.8 was a 90 degree V6 as well, but a 90 degree 4.3 liter engine, yeah, it's pretty, pretty tight. So post a link in the description if you like it. And Hope you enjoyed that. Till next time, thanks again for watching Rare Classic Cars. Happy Memorial Day weekend to everybody, and take care. Thanks for watching this video on the Oldsmobile 4.3 liter V6 diesel. Hope you enjoyed it. Please like, comment, and subscribe as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve it up to more viewers like you. Till next time, be sure to check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. And subscribe by hitting the circular icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care.